There's probably not a Masonic Lodge in the whole country that doesn't have a picture of George Washington. Why is it that Freemasons are so attached to Brother Washington? We're going to talk about it right now. Welcome to the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry channel, everybody. I am Maynard Edwards, 32nd degree KCCH, Scottish Rite Freemason, your host here on the channel. Before we get started, do me a favor. Subscribe to the channel. It helps us make more videos. Give us a thumbs up and share the video with some friends. And always welcome your questions and your comments below, especially if you're a Brother Mason or a Scottish Rite Mason. You want to say hi, shout out your lodge, shout out your valley. We love to hear from you. George Washington. I'm, I'm actually in my own home Masonic Lodge right now, and this is the picture that we've got hanging in our front room. And I will bet that most Masonic Lodges are, are kind of in the, the same boat. They, they've got a picture of Brother George somewhere. Brother George's 290th birthday was just a few days ago as I'm recording this, and I got the opportunity to talk with the historian from the Valley of Washington in the Orient of the District of Columbia of the Scottish Rite, Brother Chris Rooley, 32nd degree KCCH. He's a Scottish Rite Freemason. He's the historian in Washington, D.C. with the Washington, D.C. chapter of the Scottish Rite. And he and I talked about Brother George's Masonic career, so to speak, some of the things he did as a Freemason, and then we took some questions. This was part of a Facebook Live discussion that we did that I wanted to share with you guys here on YouTube. So here's me and Brother Chris Rooley talking about Brother George Washington. Well, so um, Mark Tabert and I, uh, down at the memorial, one of the, one, of the, one of the funny things about it is I always joke with him and I said, I can probably put down George Washington's entire Masonic history on one sheet of 11 and, you know, eight and a half by 11, one single spaced and right here's exactly all that George Washington did on one page. And Mark said, yeah, that's close. You probably cut that down by 25% and it's really still what he did. But, you know, there, he did a lot. He, he, he wasn't necessarily, I don't think a researcher would necessarily call him the most active Mason, but he was obviously a very profoundly important Mason to, to Washington, D.C., to the history of Freemasonry across the United States. So his Masonic journey begins in Fredericksburg, uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia, Fredericksburg Lodge number uh, four. He was initiated November 4th, 1752, when he was a younger man. Uh, he was then passed March 3rd, 1753 the next year and then he became a master mason august 4th 1753 so it took him you know close to what six seven months to go through the masonic degrees in fredericksburg lodge number four um he returns back to the lodge a couple times i think three or uh, 1753 he comes back around september so you know after the summer break he goes back to the lodge in September. I think he visits again, I think two years later. But again, we wouldn't necessarily call him super active um, at that time. And then, um, you know, he goes off and he goes into his public duties and work duties and, and gets wrangled in and brought into the Revolutionary War. So clearly he's got a lot going on. And during that time, um, you know, the aura, the myth of Washington starts to build up. And so he becomes, you know, the Washington that we know, the George Washington that we know. And I, you know, one of the things that Mark and other presidential Masonic historians will say is, you know, George Washington, how he joined Freemasonry, how he viewed Freemasonry is a lot different than how Ben Franklin joined Freemasonry and viewed Freemasonry. You know, Paul Revere up in, in Massachusetts, their Masonic experiences were a lot different. George Washington's was, you know, as a, as a gentleman of this society in the South, joining Freemasonry, joining Masonic Lodge was something that all gentlemen uh, of his class, of his status do. Meanwhile, you know, Paul Revere, he was a working blue collar guy. He joined the lodge. He participated in Masonic activities. He joined the Royal Arch. He was active. He, he contributed. He found ways. And then, of course, you know, Ben Franklin, past grand master, active in Masonic activities, you know, published. In, in fact, you know, we've got the picture, you know, behind us of at the library. We've got one of his the Anderson Constitutions that he printed. So, again, all these three guys did different things different ways of, of contributing masonry. 
And then as the myth of Washington starts to really boil up, you know, we're seeing him as a general, uh, he starts to get invited to Masonic activities in what they call military, ambulatory, foot lodges, these, you know, these sort of lodges that don't necessarily have a space, but they're traveling, they're part of the military, and these auras, these stories come up of George Washington. And then later on, Grand Lodges, like the Grand Lodge of Virginia, consider him so great, they said, you know, we should make this guy a Grand Master or a General Grand Master when the Grand Lodge of the General Grand Lodge of the United States potentially could become, you know, a thing. Let's make him the first General Grand Master. And there were proposals uh, are, uh, for, for several instances to make him a Grand Master. Um, I'm going to pause there because I just threw a lot at you, but I, I think the, the general the thing to know is he became a Mason young in life, generally relatively young in his, in his life. He spent a large part of that early part of that period outside of Masonry. He was still supportive. He supported the Masonry. He supported the ideals. He, he obviously had a respect for the institution, the way he wrote about the institution. He had respect for the institution, stuff like that. So go ahead, man. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that that th there are a lot of men today who who may not necessarily be super active in lodges, but nonetheless sure. are, are Masons. You know, they live their life according to that set of ideals. And I yes. think that. You know, Washington would be an example of that where it's a guy and we all know those guys that you, you came into lodge with and maybe they're not super involved with the lodge. You only see them once in a while. Right. Uh, but that they're no less a Mason than you and I, it's, you know, they, because Masonry, I, I, I say a lot. Um, Masonry is not what happens in the lodge. When the lodge, yeah. we pay bills and we, we yeah. make new Masons for sure. But yeah. beyond that, Masonry is what happens when Chris and I are hanging out and talking about stuff or, or we're yeah. out in the world living as. So I think Washington falls into that category. And then. Yeah. Ben Franklin is kind of like, uh, kind of like you and I are right now. We're involved in the day-to-day -day operations of right. Freemasons lodges and grand lodges, et cetera. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, Harry Truman, right. Like, like another past grand master of D uh, not of DC, but he was a past grand master. He, uh, was active in Freemasonry wherever he was. He in, imbued and infused the fraternity into, into, you know, into his work and into his education and made sure that he also brought in a lot of Masons, associated Masons into the craft and as well as into public life and this is public service. And so I think you could probably separate and say there's a category of Masons, just like there was a category of Masonic presidents. And I think George Washington maybe gets a good, a good, a good piece of history there, even though he really didn't do a lot relative to, let's say, Harry Truman. He may have not done a lot even compared to, uh, you know, uh, Andrew Jackson, who was himself a grandmaster, Grand yep. uh, an active during the anti-Masonic movement. Um, and, you know, that was a period where there was a lot of angst against Freemasonry. The funny thing also about the anti-Masonic movement, and I just brought this up off the top of my head, was even the anti-Masons found a way of defending George Washington, even though he was a Mason. They said, well, wait, wait a minute. And yeah, of course he joined Freemasonry, but really he denounced it in his writings and he thought it was just, you know, a fine institution, but there was not really much going on there. So even George Washington, the myth of George Washington, the way that it was created and cultivated in the United States, even the anti-Masons found a way of saying, yes, he joined, but really the principles that he espoused he found those in other places. Well, those other places they reference were the Enlightenment. And even the Masons today will tell you, well, those Enlightenment principles come into play in Masonry. So it's interesting how politics and perception, cultural, popular perception evolve and, and shift George Washington's life and his Masonic experience. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Right. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, Washington, however, despite not being super active and, and being in lodges uh, quite often, yeah. and again, guys, um, talk with brother uh, Chris Ruley, who is the uh, archivist and historian of uh, the Valley of, of Washington in the District of Columbia. Um, Washington never shied away from wearing his Masonic regalia, especially yes. in public settings, uh, specifically. And this was the one that I think is is most interesting to me is the uh, the setting of the Capitol Cornerstone. Yeah, uh, you know. When we see a cornerstone laying today, when we see a grandmaster lay a cornerstone, it's not as common as it once was, but we we have seen it. And they, they go in their tuxes and and you know the, the stone is set out and there's there's microphones and they they do the ceremony. Washington actually got down in a mud pit 
with the oh, Grandmaster yeah. of DC. So, it, it, and I know we've talked about it on the YouTube channel before, but for folks who haven't seen it, Washington laying the cornerstone. Can you kind of give us a, a, a quick yeah. rundown of that? And and, re- and just a reminder that it wasn't at the Grandmaster DC because there was no District of Columbia. There was no Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia at that point. And and what happened was the Grandmaster of Maryland, the pro tem Grandmaster of Maryland was present at that event. And he basically gave the gavel to Washington and, and Washington took the tools, took the implements and went down into the trench and laid the cornerstone as an acting Grandmaster. So, in, in, you know, to certain, uh, to certain people that say, well, he at one point served as a Grandmaster, right? He served as a Grandmaster pro tem for Maryland. But let's take a step back and let's, as you mentioned, Mayor, let's go back a step during the day. So, you know, September, uh, September 1793, George Washington helps lay the cornerstone of the United States Capitol. Now, the District of Columbia was formed three years before the Residence Act established the District of Columbia 1790. And throughout that time period, George Washington was basically given the authority to assemble the team to establish the district figure out the, you know, identify the surveyors, set up a plan, figure out the day-to-day logistics of what's going on. He's too busy. He obviously hires a, a board of three commissioners, two of which were Masons, two out of the three were Masons, and they were not public planners. They were not, you know, uh, stone masons themselves. They were not city planners. They were not architects. They were basically glorified project managers. And so Washington wanted to make sure that he knew he had a very close relationship with these guys. And so he can trust them while he's busy doing the rest of, you know, establishing and, and doing all the things that a new president of a new country would be doing. And so the first year, 1791, they lay the boundary stones, those small little stones around the district, 10 by 10 stones. The following year, the competition begins to figure out who's going to win the competition to build the White House. Washington really supports an Irish, a young Irish architect named James Hoban, who also is a, a member of a lodge called Federal Lodge Number One in D.C. And so he wins the competition. Washington is supporting him even before the competition. He's saying, hey, listen, I really like your designs. You should submit for this contest. And here are some things that I think you should be you know, thinking about when you're submitting this. So he already had a leg in during the competition anyway. The next year, 1793, they decide to lay the cornerstone of the United States Capitol. So what as a Mason you hear, you hear symbolically that you're laying the cornerstone or the boundary stones of the District of Columbia itself. Then you are laying the following year, the cornerstone of the White House, which is the executive, you know, the executive mansion. So again, symbolic of the executive. And then the third year, and we like to do things in threes, the cornerstone of the United States Capitol, that represents the people, the, the, people's, the people's building, I guess you can say, on the highest hill in downtown D.C. called Jenkins Hill. And so that day, around 10 o'clock in the morning, they cross over the Potomac. The Masons of Georgetown, as well as uh, members of AW22, Alexandria Washington, number 22, meet Washington in Georgetown. They're basically traveling. There's a huge parade, bands, banners, flags. I mean, the whole thing that you can think of, of a huge Masonic parade. By the way, there were about 800 people in the District of Columbia at the time. In fact, we know that it was 800 people because three-fourths of those, or not three-fourths, sorry, one-fourth one of those people were all stonemasons and carpenters and, and, and they were workers there to build. who were building. And guess who they decided? The commissioners decided, hey, Hoban, since you are already the architect and really doing a lot of this work, can you go and do the first census of the District of Columbia? So we know through Hoban that the first census, there was about 800 folks. So imagine 800 folks. If you had 200 of those folks even show up, that is a large percentage of the population that's just watching this going on. By the way, District of Columbia, not the district that you see now. It was all wood and, you know, it was woods and creeks and Mud. swamps. And Swamp. it, it's, it's nothing that you see today. So they're literally going from Georgetown, which was a small little town right on the port, right on the Potomac and going and crossing through forest and creeks. And so they get about, they get to the site of the Capitol building uh, about four or five hours after they get to uh, get from Georgetown. Now the stonemason, there was a stonemason in charge named Colin Williamson. He was in charge actually of setting up the foundation for the white house as well as the, the Capitol. 
he sets up the stone, the cornerstone that they're going to lay the day before. He's actually already dressed in his Masonic regalia because, you know, this is a symbolic thing. He gets his workmen to help him set the stone in the trench that we were talking about. The day of, Washington and everyone march to the hill. On their way from Georgetown, they go to the White House or the, or the space that would eventually become the White House. They pick up James Hoban and the members of Federal Lodge Number 15 of Maryland, which will eventually become Federal Lodge Number 1. And all three lodges with George Washington get to the hill. Meanwhile, they now are all assembled around the hill, the perimeter of the hill, the, the excavation site. Washington receives the tools, right? These, these, these uh, wooden and, 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 and metal silver tools that a guy named John Duffy, I think he's either from, well, he's either from Maryland or Virginia, but I want to say Maryland, a Maryland silversmith named John Duffy sets these and builds these elaborate ceremonial tools and presents the tools to him. And Washington and the three masters of those three lodges go down, descend into the trench. They lay the cornerstone and immediately after, or well, again, as custom would say, after the ceremony, Washington gives those tools and those implements to the guys that or participated in the event. And so we're fortunate to have the gavel, we're fortunate to have the trowel and those working tools that still survive today from that event. And Washington did not participate in the boundary stone cornerstone or, or the boundary stone ceremonies. He did not participate in the White House because uh, the White House cornerstone because he was too busy. So this was the only event in D.C. that he did participate in in terms of a cornerstone laying ceremony. But again, it was a momentous thing and it was a symbolic thing because it was not only just for, you know, the executive building or these small stones around the district. It was for the Capitol building, the most important building for a future capital city. So it was, it was certainly a good spot and, and, and Washington certainly I'm sure understood the, the political and the symbolic nature of making sure he got there, made sure he was dressed in his regalia, made sure that all the you know, important Masonic people there with him. A couple of uh, good questions we got and uh, guys, if yeah. you're watching live, um, we have some, uh, go ahead and drop a question in there. If we uh, can't get you the answer now, we'll uh, come back and get it another time. Yeah. Uh, Brother John Sane from uh, Valley of Knoxville wants to know, um, is it true the worshipful master of Alexandria Washington Lodge gets installed in the George Washington chair in the old lodge room replica. So we're talking about the, uh, the inside the uh, Alexandria Washington Masonic Memorial. The, if you've ever been by, you've seen it, the large, uh, large tower there, and there's a lodge room in there. So is true. Can you talk about that? Sure. Well, uh, my understanding is that that has been a custom that has been a tradition over time, right? So these tools, these relics, these desks and chairs and gavels and, and sashes and all, and even the aprons, they all started to come up with this history and they start to really become national relics of these events. And so over time, lodges like AW22 preserved those and then used those events very sparingly. So I'm not necessarily sure if they still do it. And I'm pretty sure past master of the lodge is going to reach out to me to tell me, yes, Chris, we do in fact do it. But from my understanding, I certainly understand over in the past that has been done, that was used, that they, they would use, they would install the person in the chair. So for example, the gavel, George Washington's gavel that they used for the cornerstone for a hundred and X plus years, that gavel was gifted to the master of Potomac Lodge number five in Georgetown. And it was a symbolic gesture of like, okay, you now have, you now are the one that gets uh, control of this gavel. So I can certainly understand if AW22 did that, I'm not sure if they still do that. And if they still do that, then that's a cool event that you should all check out if they do the public installation. I wouldn't want to come. I, I don't want to even touch that gavel for fear it would fall apart while it was in my hands. And you like, do not want to be that guy. You do no, not right? want me no. to write your name down in perpetuity that you were the one that broke the gavel or you were the one that stained no. the chair or, you know, Pass. get away from that thing. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't want that near me. It's yeah, like absolutely. being a lodge treasurer. No, thank you. Pass. <laughs> I don't want to be, in, I shouldn't be in charge of my own money, let alone someone else's and certainly not that gavel. Um, <laughs> That's fair. Uh, Brother Jim Robinson, Valley of Atlanta. This is an interesting question. A little bit of an opinion here. I'm not sure Ooh, okay. whether we can opine. Okay. Uh, is there anything in 2022 that Brother Washington would or would not support 
in modern Freemasonry? Interesting question. Hmm. Maynard, you take that first. I want to hear what you think. <laughs> well, I want to hear what you think first, and then I'll, um, I'm ruminating on that. Uh, I, I think that one of the ideas, um, you know, I think we, you know, obviously dues and things like that are an important part of the craft because we have buildings that we have to maintain and things like that. And, and I think, um, I think that uh, Brother Washington could possibly be disappointed in the fact that sometimes we don't do our due diligence to uh, follow up with brothers that have not paid their dues to find out what's gone wrong, either with their fraternal experience or with their um, or or with their uh, their life, where mm -hmm. they're either not able to or unwilling to to pay their dues. Mm -hmm. I think, um, and and to me that speaks to a real brotherhood of trust between. You know, because Washington, what and and from all the stories that you and I have talked about, yeah, and and the military lodges, things, masonry. While while he wasn't active in, in in lodges all the time, certainly he surrounded himself with masons who he knew were the men that subscribed to the same ideals that he did, sure. and and that trust from brother to brother, and and I think he might be. Uh, upset at the fact that they're, that we've gotten away from that a little bit. And we've, we've focused too much on our buildings and our lodges and our bills and things like that, that we're not, yeah. uh, we're not reaching out as, as we should, because every guy watching, every guy listening, it's been in a lodge. There's a guy who came through your lodge, either with you or shortly before or shortly after you that he just doesn't, he's not there anymore. Maybe he didn't pay his dues and he's suspended or something to sure. that effect. I think, uh, you know, take it upon yourself to give that guy a call and say, Hey man, what's, you know, everything. Yeah. Okay. Did somebody step on your toe and you're mad and you don't want to come back to lodge or yeah. did you run into some life problem or, you know, what, what's going on? So I think yeah. that might be it. Yeah. I think you, I think you have a very good point. I think you made a very good point. What to me, when I think of, when someone asks the question of, Oh, masonry in the back, you know, back 200 years ago, I often have to remind myself and orient myself to say, what did the Masonic Lodge of 200 years ago look like? I'll tell you what the Masonic Lodge of 200 years ago looked like. It was very small. It was very, you know, within three or four miles. So like Maynard and I, if we were in the same lodge, we lived two or three miles away from each other. And that was it. We, it was not what it is today, where especially in DC, for example, we've got brothers who live in in uh, you know Africa and Europe and they live abroad and they're sending their dues electronically and they're joining Zoom sessions. This is not the masonry of 200 years ago. This is not the masonry that George Washington saw and understood. Um, and, and, and so to me, I think, it's, I think it's more of like the lodge system is just a lot different. It would have been the same 20 guys and they were initiating a couple guys that lived down the street or the banker or the, you know, the, the town's lawyer or the town's, you know, whatever, the, the town's bureaucrat, whatever you want to call it. And so I think that that would have been something of a bit of a shell shock where a guy could come in and say, okay, well, you know, I'm going to be a Mason here and then I'm going to leave and not even see my lodge for the next 10 years. I think to George Washington, that would have been strange or peculiar. Now, granted, most of his Masonic activities outside of when he became initiated were outside of his Fredericksburg Lodge. He went to St. John's Day feasts at Alexander 22. He marched in funerals. He went to St. John's Day, you know, ceremonies and church services in New York. There's a whole section of him during the military when he attended military and foot lodges. And so he found masonry as he was traveling and he engaged with masonry as he was traveling. But for most masons, you know, you stayed in the lodge that you were in and you didn't really necessarily travel unless that was your job and you traveled and you got paperwork that said, this guy was raised here. And then you went off to a different lodge. There was not even, you know, this multi affiliation thing. You, could, you usually stayed in one lodge, usually affiliated with one lodge, and then you moved on to a different lodge. So, the way that people engaged was different. The way that, we, you know, there was a lot more camaraderie. There was a lot more engagement. Now, the other thing there was, there was a lot more fights and a lot more disagreements and everything, you know, became more personal. And you always see Masonic charges being brought up for unruly contact or unru unruly contact, unruly conduct. And, 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 you know, there was a lot more around helping the widow and helping orphans and helping, you know, people in my lodge, for example, I would see, requests for money for two or three dollars and you know every every meeting someone needed help and so i think there was a lot of that type of engagement i don't think we got that anymore. i don't think we're doing that anymore 
And, and maybe there are lodges that, are, that do that, but I don't know how frequent or popular that they are. We, yeah, and I think that we, we've gotten away from the, the lodge is not the building. The lodge is the people. Sure. The, the building is just the, like we, we just like the church, it, the congregate, the church is yes. the people is the congregation. Yes. It's not necessarily the building. The building burns down. We're yes. still a lodge. Yes. And, and I think we've gotten uh, conflated in that. Whereas there used to not be a lodge building. It used to be the upper level of a bar, sure. uh, you know, for all, for all the Masons who like to think that sure. we were all prim and proper for so many years that yeah, we were founded in taverns. I mean, the goose and the gridiron, it's a bar. Yeah. Guys. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. There was no lodge building. That's that's a you know a newer phenomenon, yeah. so to speak. Uh, you know what? I guess late nineteenth, early twentieth century, those started becoming a thing. Sure. Uh, and and I, I I think that would have been a foreign concept to to Washington. And maybe that that tends to make us focus more on the fact of the lodge being a building as opposed to yeah. the brothers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you can you can track masonry's popularity by the number and i wish there was data on this that'd be really cool of tracking how many buildings were built over time as masonry grew and became more popular i think the building became a sign of your lodge is doing well we can buy a building um and by well i mean financially well i'm not talking about the health and the integrity right. of the members in the lodge but you know the health and overall the financial stability of the lodge i mean the lodge or i'm sorry the tavern of the district of columbia where george washington went to set up the arrangements to get the lands to establish the district of columbia the tavern where thomas jefferson john adams and the commissioners sat down and said, okay, what are we going to come up with a name for this place? Let's call it the territory of Washington, Washington City, and maybe we'll call this territory or federal zone a district instead of federal zone. That same place where the first plots of land uh, were to sell you know, for the district to start to uh, raise funds for its construction also happened to be the place where the Masons met. That's where the Masons of Georgetown met. So, I mean, where activity was, usually that's where you could find a Masonic uh, building or a, not building, a Masonic congregation, a Masonic assembly, a Masonic group. So in, in uh, you know, that's purely opinion, everything we just said. That's, you know, we're, we're opining. I love that and word. our facts do not, or our comments do not represent our respective grand lodges in any other way. No, yeah, no, just we'll brother give, Chris, we'll brother that, Maynard. That's we'll it. give you that disclaimer as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, in uh, and I'm going to let you go so uh, we can both grab some lunch here. But uh, George Washington's 290th birthday. Yes. Why? And another opinion question, and I'll answer first if you want me to. Why yeah. does the legend of George Washington endure? Uh, you know. In in midst of cancel culture, people have gone after him. Yet he endures. In the midst of of mm. you know, almost two hundred and fifty years of of discussion, he is still revered. Why is it? And I, and I think it's because we got to have somebody who we just look up to and say, "This is our standard. This is our guy." Yeah. And yes, and, you know, and not that he was faultless, but he rarely faltered, you know, when he, when, you know, he, he dealt with mistakes as they came and, and really he was, I think his humbleness is what led the way. I mean, this is a, he, they yeah. could have made him King and he said, no, nah, I don't want to be King. Who right. says that? Right. If they say to me tomorrow, we want you to be King. I'm going to think really hard about it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, it'll, it'll be a tough thing to turn down. Yeah. Uh, but this guy, he legitimately turned it down. So now nah, I don't want to be King. And then after eight years said, nah, I'm done with this. I'm going to go back to Mount Vernon and, and be a farmer and just chill with my, yeah, my, my yeah. wife. That's well, that humbleness. I think that's, there's so many things that speak to us as humans about yeah. him. That's why he endures. Yeah. I think, I think that's, I think you're a hundred percent right. First of all. And I, I think it's, I think there's a little bit more to that, of course. So there's a really good book by Dave McCullough on George Washington, as well as, oh, I, I believe McCullough also did a really good book called 1776, which basically goes through the first year of the revolution. And it's, it's, it's great if you just love seeing how the sausage was made, like how people came together. It was not organized. It was a ragtag group. And we barely, barely got out of that war alive. And it was thankful. We were, we were thankful because the French came in to assist us. But Washington was doing his best to get everyone together. I think there are a couple of values that Washington espoused that 
really basically made him a great American. And unfortunately, we, not unfortunately, but we as Masons associate him with all these principal virtues are really great because these are Masonic virtues. Well, no, these are really good virtues in general. Being a humble person is a good virtue in general, not just because you're a Mason. But I think his association, the way he spoke about Freemasonry, the way that he valued the institution, even though he didn't necessarily care to attend all the lodge meetings. I think if you're thinking about it, especially just as I said that, you know, traditional masonry, you basically hung out in the same lodge. We all were in like a five mile perimeter. Here's this guy who basically almost sacrificed. I mean, he wrote, he writ, you know, when he joined the, the cause of the American freedom, he basically made, a, he basically put everything out there because if they lost, he would lose his life. He would lose his entire fortune. He would lose his family's fortune. He would lose the entire legacy would be gone. He was not perfect. The man was not perfect, but what he did a good job at, uh, what, what, what was, what he did well was he had humility. He also had a lot of pressure put upon him. And for, because of all that pressure, he decided instead of turning one way and saying, wait a minute, I can solve all of my debt issues by becoming king of the United States. And we would have gladly given it to him. John Adams was anxious and was waiting to figure out, well, is he going to do this or not? We're nervous about this thing because he could turn into a tyrant, into a king. But he knew civility. He knew those values that were instilled on him when he became a Mason, even before he became a Mason. Those values really, um, really stood up and served the test of time. And it became the precedent for future presidents. And for what, several decades, people looked and said, you gotta follow what Washington did because that was the appropriate way to do it. He set the standard. And so with anything, you can say that he was the standard setter. He figured it out how to do it. When, when for what, 300 years, 400 years of civilization, of post-enlightenment civilization, no one could figure it out. The French Revolution, reverted back to tyranny, you know, immediate, almost immediately after it occurred. So there was just something special about him. And, and I think we attach ourselves as Masons to these values and say, oh, he wasn't he so great? And look at all the things that he did. But if you remove, just even remove that he was a Mason, all those values, someone would have replicated those values in Masonic Lodge and said, these are all the important values. And it just so happens that he was also a Freemason. And so I'll leave you with that. I'm not, I'm not really sure that you can say it was his Masonic values. I think he had enlightenment values. I think he had a lot of humility. I think he knew that there was a lot of pressure on him. And God damn, he was a really good leader. He was just a oh, great yeah. leader. He was well, that's what I was going to say. We, we should not underestimate the fact that when you think about this guy, he was six feet tall, you know, this strapping military. Yeah. We get, get on top of the horseback. He looks... He looks yeah. like he could kick somebody's ass. Yeah. yeah. You know, this, well, you this, this guy is no joke. You do not screw with the president. Like, and guess what? Do you, not. But you need to, because if, if you basically sold a bill and said, I am now indebted my life to this cause, because the alternative is immediate death for myself and family and everyone who joined me in this. Well, and everybody around me too. Like, you know, it wasn't just yeah. anybody who was exactly. near him. Exactly. So, so you are, you, I mean, and you got to remember how many founding fathers were persecuted by the British immediately after signing the declaration. You can go back and review and see how many were prisoned, how many were killed, how many were tortured. And so Washington knew exactly what was coming to him if he didn't do it. And he was hoping to God that this will work. And he enjoyed in turn to engage everyone and all the people around him. Now, it just so happened that it's a lot easier to get all these guys as part of this. And it's a lot easier for them to learn and to be educated. Some of these were guys were Masons. So he hired, you know, he brought in all these Masons because he knew these guys already know the enlightenment values that I share. Let's bring him, uh, let's bring them on. These guys, you know, fight for this cause. And they're also Masons. That's fantastic. It's sort of like a litmus test, if you will, of like, okay, at, at the very least, I know that they were told this and they were these values that they were espoused in the Masonic Lodge. At the very least, he knew that someone told them about them and that it's important. Almost 300 years since the birth of George Washington, and he's still 
an article of fascination, not only for Freemasons, but for folks all over the world. And Freemasons are certainly not shy about claiming him as one of our own. So happy birthday, Brother George, and thanks for everything you did for us. Hey, if you're watching this video and you want to learn how to become a Freemason, click this video right here and it's going to give you a step-by-step -step process to follow on how to connect with a Masonic Lodge. And if you're already a Master Mason interested in joining the Scottish Rite, click this link right here and it's going to take you to the Scottish Rite website where you can sign up to become a Scottish Rite Mason right now.